about that. Yep. So. No worries. Welcome, Jess, and thank you for taking the time out to come and talk to us today. Uh, okay. All right, perfect. Now do you see my total screen again? Yeah. All right, yay technology. Okay, great, yes, absolutely. I'm so excited to be here. And um, uh, as mentioned, my name is Jess Yarnell and I am uh, currently a data scientist at a healthcare organization. So just quickly wanted to go over an agenda of what I'm going to talk about today. First, I'll just talk about a quick about me, then what exactly is data science? Uh, talk about my journey to data scientist, uh, some projects that I've worked on, some useful resources for me, both while I was learning and also resources that I still use. And then finally, we'll get to the Q&A. Oh, sorry, just one quick thing. Could you yes. make Cindia a co-host? <laughs> she okay. transferred her powers to you. <laughs> Okay, you should be co-host now. Do you have the, okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no worries. All right, get them back. Perfect, okay. Um, so about me, I was born and raised in Philadelphia. I've always lived in Philadelphia. So went to elementary school here, went to high school here, even for my undergrad degree, I went to Temple University. And then for my master's degree, I went to Villanova, which is just right outside of Philadelphia, but I've always been around Philadelphia. So part of um, growing up in Philadelphia is that I'm really into Philadelphia sports specifically I really love the Flyers the uh, Flyers are the Philadelphia hockey team and so I have some pictures here of me throughout the years meeting various Flyers players I like to uh, go to the games watch the games on TV go to events that players are going to be at and I also collect memorabilia I also love my pets. So I have a dog um, that I rescued about seven years ago. I also have a cat and more recently I um, got a bearded dragon. So I really love my pets. And then I also love video games. So I started playing video games when I was about three with Super Nintendo, uh, played Mario. There was a Lion King game on the Super Nintendo that I just absolutely loved. And uh, more recently I got the PlayStation 5 and you can see here my dog was almost as excited as I was. So now what is data science? We're using this term and I think it's important to talk about what it is. Uh, data science is a, um, a buzzword a lot of the times and uh, it can be confusing. So when I started to prepare for the talk, I thought why not find the definition of data science? I'm sure somebody said it more eloquently than I could. And what was interesting is I found a lot of conflicting definitions, which I think makes it really hard for people that are trying to get into the field. Um, and so it's not something that's necessarily easy. So for me, data science, this is what I would consider data science is it's the combination of computer science, math and statistics and business and domain expertise. So when you just have computer science and math and statistics, you'd get machine learning, math and statistics and um, business and domain expertise, you have data analysis. And then traditional software would be the combination of computer science and business and domain expertise. So when you combine them all together, you get data science. And what I think is important to point out about this is that you don't necessarily need to be an expert in all three areas. Uh, something that I talked to my advisor about when I was in my master's program was the fact that um, I have a computer science degree and I've been working in healthcare for a while, but I don't necessarily have a degree in statistics. And he gave me advice that I think is really insightful and helpful when you're trying to break into the field, which is that a good data science team will have experts in each area. So you might have a data scientist who's really good at statistics, but doesn't know how to code, doesn't have that computer science aspect. Or you might have someone that 
knows how to code, but maybe doesn't have the domain expertise. So what's important is that for data science, you need to have um, abilities in all of these areas, but don't necessarily need to have uh, the expertise in every single area in order to be a good and effective data scientist. So just talking about some examples of data science, I think it's important to kind of provide some real world examples. Uh, one example that we'll see is in um, customer analytics. Uh, you can use data science to manage permissions and discounts. Uh, you can also use data science to scan social media. Maybe a celebrity is advertising a specific product and you can help forecast which you can use data science to help forecast which products will be in demand. Also, uh, if you've ever been on a website and have some uh, items in your cart, you'll notice that you'll start to get a recommendation for other similar items and data science can help with that. In terms of sales analytics, data science can be used to help uh, a salesperson decide which products or services to suggest to a client. Recommendation systems, if anybody has uh, Spotify, for example, Spotify will recommend uh, music to you based off of your listening preferences and data science is what helps with that. And credit scoring, that's actually one of the uh, areas that, one of the earliest areas that we started to see data science. So for example, a bank might look at a customer's banking history to see their credit worthiness, see whether or not they're likely to default on a loan. Uh, similarly, you can also use uh, data science to flag suspicious behavior or fraud detection if something's out of the norm of how a um, person usually purchases something, data science can be used to flag that. And then with weather predictions, we know that um, uh, you can predict uh, what the sky coverage is going to be, precipitation, snowfall, um, whether or not there's going to be a thunderstorm or something like that, and data science is what helps with that. So next, I'm just going to talk about my journey to data scientist. So I'd really consider my journey starting uh, when I got my bachelor's degree in May of 2013 and ending when I became a data scientist in January of 2022. So I'll go into detail with all these milestones, but these are what I would consider the key milestones both in school and employment for me. So first, my bachelor's degree. So I actually don't have a bachelor's degree in tech. I got a um, psychology degree from Temple University, and I was a criminal justice minor. Part of my uh, bachelor's degree for psychology required taking some basic statistics courses. So I did have a couple of introductory statistics courses. And I also realized when I was um, taking classes that I wasn't necessarily interested in the research aspect, uh, or excuse me, the um, the therapy aspect of psychology. I was more interested in the research aspect. So I knew when I once I graduated, I didn't necessarily want to be a therapist or a social worker. So after I graduated, because I wasn't going into the therapy or um, go and become a, a student in psychology for graduate school, I took a job as a customer service representative in a healthcare organization, specifically which specialized in medical billing. What was actually interesting about this is patients would call with questions about their medical bills and often they weren't uh, mundane questions, but really questions that were unique and not something that we saw a lot. So through that, I was really able to learn about edge cases and medical billing. I also learned a lot about patient satisfaction. Patients would call and let us know what they thought we were doing well and what we weren't doing well. And it was really helpful for me in getting my feet wet in healthcare and understanding how decisions that are made higher up affect the patient. So after being a customer service representative for about a year and a half, I got my first job as a reimbursement analyst. Uh, this again was in a healthcare organization for medical billing. Uh, this is when I started using Access and Excel to um, answer data requests. So not necessarily programming, but just starting to do analytical work in analyzing data. And so while I was a reimbursement analyst, uh, I realized I really liked the analyst aspect. And so I decided I wanted to go back to school for either computer science or software engineering, something in programming. So what I did was I looked at uh, local universities around the Philadelphia area and I checked to see what their prerequisites were. 
because I didn't have a STEM background, I didn't have a um, uh, undergrad degree in computer science, and instead it was a um, arts degree, I knew that I was probably going to have to take some courses. So what I found out was that a lot of the schools in the area uh, have the same prerequisites, regardless of if you have a um, undergrad degree in STEM or not. So I was able to uh, get a programming certificate through the classes that were needed for the prerequisite for the computer science masters. And some of these classes included Java programming, uh, Java one and Java two, also some advanced math. I had to take um, uh, up to the Calc two for this, uh, some discrete mathematics, things like that. And so through doing that, I had all of the prerequisites I needed for the computer science master's program that I was interested in. So then shortly after that, in August of 2017, I began my computer science master's. Uh, I actually started as a software engineering major and pretty early in the class, I realized I didn't wanna be a software engineer and I was really interested in um, machine learning and data science. So I switched to computer science. Uh, right around this time in September, I started working as a finan the financial analyst at the healthcare organization and medical billing. And this is when I started learning SQL and also started working on financial projections and answering more in-depth data questions. Next, I uh, got a job as a business intelligence analyst, again, at a healthcare organization and medical billing. Uh, I started using SQL more in depth, answering more complex questions. And then I also started using Tableau. And for those who don't know, Tableau is a business intelligence tool that's used to um, display data in um, dashboards. And so this is when I started to learn about how to tell stories with data, how to um, show data in a way that the end user uh, will be able to answer business questions and make data-driven decisions with the uh, dashboards that were being created. And at this time, I was still in school uh, in my master's program, and I started working in the Sparks Coding Lab. The Sparks Coding Lab is something that I'll talk about in a bit more detail in a couple of slides. However, uh, specifically, while in the lab, I, this is when I started working with Python, machine learning, and deep learning. And I also started uh, doing research presentations and working on publications. Next, from a career perspective, I uh, started working as a data analyst in October of 2019. Uh, this was at a different healthcare organization than the one I talked about previously. And while previously the healthcare organization specialized in medical billing, this one was more clinical. So what I was able to do is I was able to expand my domain knowledge. I no longer just had knowledge about healthcare billing, but also had clinical knowledge as well. I also started using R programming um, and various other business intelligence tools. So really expanded my skill set and the tools that I was able to work with. Finally, in September of 2020, I finally finished my uh, computer science master's. And there are three things when looking back at it that I wanted to talk about in a little bit more detail that I think helped me ultimately have success in um, both um, my classes and as well as in my career. Uh, networking, being selective about electives, and being selective about what I wrote my master's thesis on. So first, networking. Uh, this is something that I didn't do very well when I was an undergrad, and it had um, a tremendous effect when I was in graduate school. So I went to my graduate director, and I let him know what I was interested in, what interest I had, what areas he thought made sense for me to start working um, towards for my computer science degree, what electives would be good to take. And he was really helpful in um, making sure that I was set up for success. So when I talked to him, I let him know that I had an interest in machine learning and that I worked in healthcare. And he was actually the one that recommended the sparse coding lab to me. So at the time that he recommended it, I didn't have any experience in machine learning or Python programming or anything that the, I really had to do in the lab. So uh, through the connection with him, I started talking to the professor and he, the professor that ran the lab and he set me up uh, with all of the essentially initial readings and things that I needed in order to get a good start um, in the lab. 
And so once I learned, I uh, helped author a publication and I always I also worked on Intel's neuromorphic computing chip. And this was a chip that Intel allows researchers to work on. So it was a really um, insightful and exciting experience. Also through talking with the graduate director, he referred me to a tuition scholarship. And so when you're in a master's program, a lot of uh, students who are full-time take three classes at a time. At this time, I was only taking one class. And what I found out was that uh, unlike um, undergraduate, in a master's, you can take two classes and be considered full-time. So what I was able to do is just up my course load by taking two classes. And then I got a scholarship. And part of the scholarship was just working on research a couple hours a week. And so through this research, I actually entered a, um, a research competition at the university where I won first place for my research and was admitted to Sigma Xi, which is a um, organization for researchers. Also the graduate director, because he knew what my interests were and um, what research that I was working on, he's actually the one that recommended a lot of different conferences to me. Uh, one of the conferences that he recommended in particular was one that I hadn't heard of and he suggested that the research that I was working on would be good to possibly apply to present at the conference. And so I did apply and was able to present a poster. And so that was something that had I not networked, I wouldn't have known about otherwise. I was also really selective about my electives. In um, my undergrad, I would take classes based off of what worked best with my schedule. If I didn't want to take an 8 a.m. class, I wouldn't sign up for it, even if I was interested in a particular course. And that's something that I changed um, when I went for my master's. So I uh, specifically took machine learning. I was already working in the sparse coding lab, but I wanted to expand my knowledge on machine learning. And so as we saw in the previous Venn diagram, uh, machine learning is uh, one of the building blocks for data science. So it was really helpful for me to take this course. I also had a personal project that I worked on as part of the coursework there. And I'll talk about it in a bit more detail, but it's actually something that I um, used when I was applying to become a data scientist. In terms of deep learning, uh, deep learning is a part of machine learning. Uh, so it allowed me to fine tune my machine learning knowledge. Um, it also uh, gave me the building blocks for what I wrote my thesis on. And then human computer interaction. This is actually a course that was really helpful for me from um, presenting data. Uh, so it was helpful for dashboards. Uh, human computer interaction is essentially uh, the study of how humans interact with computers and technology. And so knowing how the end user was likely to view a dashboard and what direction their eyes look and things like that, it was really helpful to be able to um, create something that the end user would be able to use easily and efficiently. And then also what I wrote my master's thesis on, I was very selective about. I specifically found an advisor that would be able to allow me to work on both um, deep learning and healthcare. So deep learning was something that I was interested in from a schooling perspective and healthcare, as I, as I explained, I've been working in healthcare for quite some time now. So I was able to combine my knowledge from school and employment. And then finally, uh, in January of 2022, I became a data scientist. So this again was at a healthcare organization. Um, and as I mentioned, I presented the classwork from my master's when I applied. So part of the application process was to uh, present a data science project that you had worked on. And although I hadn't worked on anything professionally in data science, because I had worked on a project in machine learning, I was able to use that work uh, when applying to um, the job. And so part of my work uh, involves uh, predictive models and then also statistics. So to summarize everything, from a schooling perspective, I got my bachelor's in a non-tech degree, uh, went back and got a programming certificate. So I had the prerequisites for the master's program and then went and got my master's in uh, computer science. From an employment perspective, I had nine years in healthcare um, and then seven of those years were as an analyst. So if we think back to the Venn diagram, we talked about how computer science, math and statistics, and domain expertise are needed for data science. And so I have the computer science aspect since I got my master's in computer science. 
I also have the domain expertise because I've been working in healthcare so long. And from a math and statistics aspect, those were some of the courses that I had to take for the programming certificate and the prerequisites that I needed for computer science, but I don't necessarily have a statistics degree. And so while I was working on this, I just wanted to um, reflect on my journey. So these are some things that I brought up at the beginning. What are my interests uh, in my about me? And so I talked about how I love the flyers. And one of the things I did when I was first learning analytics was I practiced uh, displaying analytics and doing different statistics using game stats. So I would watch a Flyers game and get the stats, maybe how many missed shots there were, block shots, things like that. And I used something that I was interested in to um, learn more. In terms of I love pets, uh, I love my pets. My machine learning project that I worked on was something I was passionate about. I rescued my dogs seven years ago and my machine learning project, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a few slides, was about rescue animals. So it was really helpful working on something that I was interested in when I was learning, because a lot of this learning is not easy. It takes a lot of trial and error. So having an end product that you're passionate about is really helpful in that learning experience. And then also I talked about how I love video game. So I practice coding by creating small video games. Um, this is something that coding in particular didn't necessarily come intuitively and easy for me. So it was something I really had to work at. And again, working on something that I was interested in helped get over those hurdles of having these questions and maybe not getting code to run. And just through doing that and through working on things that I was interested in, it really helped me in my learning experience. Next, I'm gonna talk about some of the projects that I've worked on, uh, but before I do, I just want to um, level set the definitions and th the definitions of the words that I'm going to talk about. Uh, similar to data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning um, are buzzwords that can be used interchangeably. So the for, for the purposes of what I'm talking about, artificial intelligence just mimics human intelligence. Machine learning is a part of artificial intelligence and it's learning through training. And then finally, deep learning is a part of machine learning and um, it involves artificial neural networks and just really simply explained artificial neural networks be like um, mimicking early understanding of how we thought the brain worked. So the first project that I worked on, I had mentioned I worked in the sparse coding lab. So sparse coding, uh, sparse stood for a spiking and recurrent software and then coding lab. So those are a lot of uh, big words that we don't necessarily need to go over today, but essentially uh, I would just describe it as deep learning. So for the paper that I worked on, it was called a neuromorphic sparse coding defense to adversarial images. Again, we can kind of just simplify this into can deep learning be used to defend against adversarial attacks? And adversarial attacks is, I think, a really interesting aspect of um, deep learning that I'll just talk about briefly. Essentially, what an adversarial attack is, is it's an attack on an image through adding noise to the image so that a computer can no longer detect what it could previously detect. So in this particular example, we have a praying mantis and a dog the computer could easily detect that the top picture was the praying mantis and the bottom picture was the dog. Then this middle column of pictures, we have some noise. So if we add these noise to the first image, uh, we see the uh, third column of images. Still, we can tell this is a praying mantis and a dog. However, a computer can no longer tell that. Uh, so it confuses the um, machine learning algorithm or deep learning algorithm that you're using to classify the images. So this was one of the projects that I worked on in order to get started towards data science. And um, the answer to this question for the paper that I worked on was that, yes, we can use deep learning to defend against adversarial attacks. Also, I mentioned the uh, thesis that I worked on. So the title of my thesis was X-ray classification using deep learning and the mimic MXR or sorry, mimic CXR data set. And the question that I was trying to ask is, can deep learning be used to detect pathology in lateral chest x-rays? Essentially, what this project was meant to do is use the deep learning algorithm to see if a patient had a particular um, diagnosis 
based on just looking at the chest x-ray. So again, this is similar to the previous work in terms of we're looking at image classification. And uh, while I won't go into the details, the answer to this question was again, yes, we can use it. And then another project that I worked on, which I think is the one that was um, the most instrumental in my career um, becoming a data scientist because I actually presented this as part of my application was um, uh, predicting animal shelter outcomes using the random forest algorithm. The random forest algorithm is a type of machine learning algorithm for classification. And so the question was, can we use machine learning to classify or predict the outcomes of animal shelter, cats and dogs, based on their age, breed, color, and gender? And this data was publicly available. So anyone would be able to try and solve this problem. I just went on um, to government websites and was able to download the data uh, for their shelters. And then I um, cleaned the data up and then ran it through this algorithm. And so for dogs, uh, the algorithm was able to predict dog outcomes with 85% accuracy. This image on the right here is the four features that I talked about, breed, color, age, and gender. And what's interesting about this is anyone who's familiar with dogs knows um, that a lot of people are very interested in specific breeds of dogs. Uh, so certain dogs might be more likely to get adopted faster. Similarly, there are other dog breeds that um, are in shelters for a long time. It's harder to adopt them. So we can see through this algorithm that we were able to predict whether or not a dog was going to be able to, or whether or not a dog was going to get adopted with 85% accuracy and what the dog's breed was, was the most determining factor in that. In terms of cats, uh, not quite the uh, as high accurate, but still 71% accuracy, we could predict the outcomes. And unlike dogs, cats' um, uh, determination for whether or not they were going to be adopted uh, wasn't breed, but was age. I, I think that this is um, makes a lot of sense if we think about uh, cats and what uh, is uh, something that's desirable in whether or not you're adopting a cat. So cat breeds aren't necessarily as um, prominent as dog breeds. A lot of cats might be just like tabby cats, but age, so whether or not it's a young cat or a kitten was something that uh, was more important for determining whether or not a cat was going to be adopted. And again, this is something that um, while I learned about this information uh, in my master's classes, it's something that I would have otherwise been able to, to do the project on because everything was publicly available. And so now I just wanted to talk about some useful resources. Uh, the first couple of resources that I want to talk about have to do with um, programming guides and courses. Uh, if anyone isn't familiar with Reddit, Reddit has a ton of different subreddits and you can go to a lot of different coding subreddits. One of the ones that I found really interesting and helpful when I was first learning was Learn Programming and their FAQ. They have a list of tons of free resources that you can use um, to get started in coding whatever programming language you're interested in. There's also a book called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. This is what I use to learn Python. Um, this book is free. Uh, you can go to the website and it has instructions on how to do a lot of things that are really interesting um, and cause it boring stuff. But one of the examples of something that you can learn is you can uh, uh, write a program, an application that scrapes a web page to tell what the weather is. So you can essentially create your own weather app. Humble Bundle. Uh, this is um, something that is a little bit unique. So Humble Bundle is known for video games, but they also have these bundles. Uh, right now, unfortunately, I looked it up and there aren't any really good ones for what we're talking about today. But they have bundles that um, are either books or software based off of a particular topic. And so you might have something that's like learn data science. Uh, and so it's a bunch of different books uh, about data science or learn coding and a bunch of different books about coding, learn SQL, learn machine learning, things like that. So uh, these are um, updated fairly frequently with new bundles. So I definitely recommend looking at them and seeing if there's any bundles that interest you. And the cool thing about Humble Bundle is the uh, money goes towards charity. 
then MIT OpenCourseWare. This is a um, list of courses from MIT that were recorded. A lot of them are a little bit older, um, but essentially an entire semester of whatever course that you're interested in was recorded, was recorded and all of the syllabus information, the homeworks, the exams, the quizzes, everything is available for completely free. So you can go on and learn about a particular topic. I actually use this to learn about linear algebra because I hadn't taken linear algebra and I just followed along with the linear algebra course. They also have different programming courses, other maths and things like that. And then W3 schools. This is something that is pretty common. Um, I still use it all the time, uh, especially with SQL. If I don't remember how to do something in SQL, I'll look, up, I'll look it up on W3 schools. It's really useful. There are other um, languages as well there. And so it's helpful to just get started and even as a reference later on when you already know a particular language. In terms of uh, data, data visualization, excuse me, um, Tableau and RA, I talked about these already. Uh, Tableau has uh, something called Makeover Monday, and then R has something called Tidy Tuesday. And like the name suggests, Makeover Monday is on Mondays, Tidy Tuesday is on Tuesdays. And uh, these are essentially uh, fun little exercises that both of these um, groups uh, release data sets for, and it'll be a data set about something and you can visualize the data. And so what's great about this is because it's a community working together, a lot of people are a requirement of it is actually to uh, share your code so that others can know how you did a specific visualization or dashboard. And this is really helpful for me because I'll go and look at different um, visualizations and actually learn about new packages in R or how to do something different that I didn't otherwise know because the community is all working together on a specific data set each week. And then some other miscellaneous stuff. Um, awesome machine learning is, as the name suggests, awesome. Uh, it's a GitHub repository that just has a ton of information, uh, lots of free resources, uh, anything that you could really think of in regards to machine learning. You can just go in here and look. There's free books, um, free tutorials, lots of really great things. Uh, Python Data Science Handbook. This is a free book that you can um, access and it's essentially, as the name suggests, uh, data science and learning um, data science with Python. And then uh, just wanted to quickly talk about the IRIS data set. So anyone who has learned programming, any programming language knows that the first thing that you learn how to do in the programming language is print hello world. Uh, so the IRIS data set is the hello world equivalent for machine learning. So if you want to get started in machine learning, I'd really just recommend looking at this data set and looking up resources. I'm sure um, awesome machine learning has resources for um, how to uh, do um, different machine learning algorithms on this data set, but something to get you started. I think the first place to do so would just uh, be through learning the IRIS data set. And that's it. So thank you all for listening. I know we have some questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jess. We had a question about using data science with financial projections. Yes. So have you worked with any financial data or have any resources for doing that sort of work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, so when I was a financial analyst, I worked on projections um, that would be more towards looking at um, money that was already coming in and then making a change to something, whether it be a contract since it was a medical billing, so a contract with an insurance company, and then seeing what effect that contract would have on future financials. And so the idea of that is with healthcare, but there's a lot of data sets that are available that you can use to get started with that. Um, so I, what I would suggest is uh, um, Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E. That's a website that has um, a, essentially data science competition, but it also has a um, ton of 
uh, data sets that you can access and start working on. So I would recommend just like finding something and start visualizing the data and start thinking about what changes that you can make to the data and then seeing what happens with those changes. Are there specific kinds of like questions that you would ask about financial data versus like other kinds of data? Or does it all kind of fit into like similar buckets as any other type of data? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, there are definitely certain questions that you're going to ask. Uh, I think with financial data, the key thing that you're interested in is, are we going to get more money or lose money? Um, so, you, so you have to focus on that question. And so I think with any data that you're working with, just think um, about what your end user is going to be interested in. So um, you can visualize financial data a lot of different ways. How much um, is customer X bringing in? How much is customer Y bringing in? So uh, kind of stratifying by different areas. You can also trend it. Uh, how much money did we make over time? What's the um, amount of money that we made this year versus last year? Things like that. And so that's going to be something different than if you're looking at other data. Uh, but the I think the uh, main idea around data is going to be similar regardless of the data set like uh, you're going to be interested in information over time if you have a time component of the data you're going to be interested in bucketing different categories so there's similarities and differences so really just trying to think about what the ultimate question that the end user that you're going to give this data to is most interested in and then working a visualization based off of that really cool so Matt asks, how often do you work with time series data and whether you agree that it's really important for the financial data specifically? Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, time series data uh, is when I worked as a financial analyst, the majority of the work that I did. Um, still work with time series data as a um, uh, data scientist. So it is something um, that you're probably going to work on a lot, depending on what industry that you're in. Um, and yeah, it is really important. So I would definitely focus um, when you're learning uh, to learn about different time series algorithms and things like that. The projects that I talked about were all classification problems. So I talked about uh, how a computer classifies an image, both um, or a computer algorithm classifies an image, both um, from the adversarial tax example and the thesis example. And then for the shelter outcomes, it was uh, not an image, but it was data that was um, fed into the algorithm to classify an outcome. And so that's different than time series. So uh, if that's something that you're interested in, in terms of financials or other industries, I think it is important to, to learn about. So speaking of learning, our other question was, do you feel like the education you had prepared you for your day-to-day -day job? So did the background in healthcare help you feel more prepared or did you feel like you had to like learn a lot on the job? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I did not have uh, experience with logistic regression, which is one of the questions that came up in my interview for a data scientist, and I, I was familiar with it from reading about it, but I didn't learn about it in school. And I reached out to my um, professor that taught me machine learning. I let him know I got this job as a data scientist, but also let him know that this question had come up. And he, uh, his um, a response was uh, kind of comical in the sense that he considered uh, this type of algorithm lower than what he would teach in machine learning in terms of difficulty, mm -hmm. and also wasn't something that he was necessarily interested in from a research perspective. So that's why it didn't come up in the class. So it was actually something that I had to teach myself because I didn't learn about it in my class that I would have learned about had I taken a statistics course as a graduate student. So there were aspects that I needed there were aspects, there are aspects of my job that I needed to teach myself. Um, 
that the coursework in and of itself wasn't necessarily enough. But I think it's like that with everything. Uh, you're not gonna be able to learn everything. So there are a ton of things that I learned about in school that are extremely helpful in my day-to-day -day job. So just understanding that, um, especially in technology fields, uh, there's constant learning. The, the, the um, industry is always changing. So it's important to, to stay up to date and to, to learn about things because it's, um, unless you're, taking a class on every single subject, you're not going to know everything. And um, I think school and taking certain classes really helps prepare you for how to do research on your own and learn about these things without having a, a syllabus in front of you that uh, tells you exactly what everything that you need to learn is. Now that you're in the job, have you found yourself spending more time on the programming aspect of it or on like the statistics like what do you find yourself brushing up on more i like, find myself brushing up yeah sorry go ahead oh and i was just gonna say like what's like changing a lot are there like new application areas with all these advances in machine learning that you have to stay on top of too mm -hmm. yeah so so far i found myself reading up more on statistics and i think that makes sense because i don't have a statistics degree had I had a statistics degree, then I probably would spend more time reading up on um, uh, the computer science and the uh, coding aspect of it. Um, part of my interest in this field is that I'm, I'm just genuinely interested in the advancements of it. So I do try to stay up to date on reading about new advancements and everything. Um, but yeah, I do have to um, kind of know what my limits are. And if I'm not particularly sure about what statistical tests to run for a particular problem, read up on it and understand what one would be best because I don't quite remember it from psych my psychology introduction to statistics course. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What kind of uh, healthcare data have you applied data science to? Like, is it like data across the whole like system from like billing to like patient information to like yeah. outcomes? Yeah, it could be anything. So I haven't necessarily worked with outcomes, but it is something that other data scientists in the organization that I work with do. Um, there's uh, financial data. Uh, yes, there's um, uh, operational data that I've worked with as well. So for example, um, uh, operational data would be um, how many patients did you see on a particular day and how many patients do you anticipate seeing 10 days from now? Yeah, that makes sense. So basically any questions the organization might ask, then you could try and answer them with data science. Yeah, exactly. And while I have experience in healthcare, I think um, the healthcare experience that I have just allows me to know um, certain jargon and how things work. Uh, but the general idea of data science is going to be similar across industries. So um, the healthcare problems that I work on, I can also work on similar problems in the finance industry or in a different industry. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you talked a little bit earlier about networking, but do you have any recommendations for like how to network or do you want to reemphasize like how important you found it or at like what stage like would yeah. you recommend doing it earlier or later in your job yeah. search? Yeah, really good question. So to be completely candid, I did no networking when I was an undergraduate and I it really hurt me. Um, I didn't talk about it in my talk, but I knew I didn't want to be a uh, therapist. Um, and I thought uh, I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't really network and talk to anybody about exactly what I wanted to do. So I just applied to a bunch of PhD programs and something that I thought would interest me. And I didn't get in. And the reason I didn't get in is because I didn't have the application that had specific areas that would be applicable to what I thought I was interested in. Had I talked to somebody, I would know that I wasn't interested in this or I was interested in this. So I kind of did the opposite when I went into my master's program where I think I was there for like a month or two and I went to my graduate, the graduate director and just started talking to him and told him, I don't really like this uh, software engineering course. Um, I don't think I want to do programming on applications. Uh, what do you think? And he was really helpful. So I actually did the opposite. Uh, 
from the for the master's program and through networking with him i started to be able to network with other people as well uh so it really kind of just um as uh, snowballs uh you talk to one person they'll refer you to another person another person another person so my advice is if you're in school just talk to your professors and let them know what you're interested in and if you're not in school i think women who code is a great start to networking uh, but also just focus on um areas that you're interested in and uh, doing meetups like that what kind of businesses hire data scientists I, I think that there is a need for data science in every business, uh, but some businesses don't necessarily believe that. So healthcare is one of the, um, I would say later industries to get into data science. Um, financial industry was one of the earlier ones. And so there, if you look at uh, banking institutions, you'll see a need for data scientists there. Um, healthcare is another one, um, really just a Facebook, um, just hired a ton of data scientists. Um, sports is really um, starting to work on um, advanced analytics, which is data science. Uh, the Flyers just um, hired a, a lot of, I, a lot, like six people or so. They just started hiring data scientists because they haven't been good for quite some time. So they thought hopefully the advanced analytics will help them. So tons of industries. It, um, it really depends. What I found was really helpful is just going on like uh, Glassdoor and picking an industry and typing data scientists and see the job description. Um, and you can see all the different industries that have data scientists. I think probably every single option for an industry would have a data scientist position listed. So Joel wants to know if you're going to apply to be a data scientist for the Flyers. <laughs> I thought about it. Um, uh, the job application said nights and weekends occasionally required. I was like, no, because then I work nights and go weekends watch now. The games. So, yeah, so I'll just watch <laughs> and then wonder what the data scientists are actually doing when things don't work out well. I would love to though, but um, no, I didn't apply. I do like healthcare a lot. Kind yeah, of it sounds like. Have... Sorry, go ahead. Becca. Sorry, go ahead, Cynthia. No, I, that was actually a really awesome question, Joel. <laughs> um, I, I have a few questions, actually. Uh, I was actually truly impressed how you, um, with, with an undergrad of non-technical background and moved into a much more technical and the most technical area of uh, data, data analytics and data science. Uh, do you think your role as data analyst helped you become a data scientist? Is it required for folks like anyone starting up to first start out? start out as a data analyst to then venture into data science? What, what do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it helped, but I don't think it's required. My journey is just an example. Um, and so the work that I did as a data analyst is helpful for me now as a data scientist, but um, there are lots of different ways to get into data science. So there's not necessarily like a very rigid path. You have to be a data analyst first and then be a data scientist. And there are people um, who are data scientists and then decide that they want to be a data analyst. So you can actually go in the opposite direction. So it's not a requirement. It's just that there are aspects of um, data analysts in the data science field. Thank you. Uh so I know you shared a lot of fantastic resources for anyone to get started. Do you think there are organizations, now that you mentioned there are, there's a lot of hiring going on for data science. Do you think there'll be any um, organizations that will be open for volunteer opportunities or if someone's starting up who can just go and volunteer, contribute and learn? Yeah, yeah, I do. I think so. I think um, because data science is so hot uh, in such a, a buzzword that it's kind of a double-edged sword is yes there are going to be organizations that you can volunteer at but there's going to be a lot of applications for other people to volunteer as well um, so it's one of those things that it could be hard to get into um, so while looking for volunteer opportunities i'd actually recommend start working on projects um, through working on projects you're going to find volunteer opportunities and part of um uh networking is um 
working on things and talking to people. And so that's something that you're going to do while you're working on projects. So yes, so, and to be more detailed about your question is, I don't necessarily have a specific list of organizations, but I would uh, recommend just looking at areas that you're interested in and talking to people, see if they have a data need and that you can start volunteering uh, because it's kind of hard to sell data science. Data science is kind of like a, a scary word to people who don't already have data scientists, but there's always a need for data. Um, so starting out with data and then working on problems uh, with a data science lens. That's a good point, thanks Jessica. I do have one more question. So as a data scientist, how often do you always uh, get ready to use data? How often do you have to actually make the data usable? Is it is it a myth for, for us to consider that the data is readily available and it's ready to use? Yeah, good question. Uh, part of data science and depending on who you're asking to in either a joy of data science or a pain of data science is um, taking data and making it usable. Uh, so oftentimes data scientists are gonna get data that's not usable. In my example about the uh, um, shelter outcomes for the project that I worked on, the data was collected and the person who was collecting the data obviously had no idea Josh Arnold from Philadelphia was gonna take it and try and run a machine learning algorithm on it. So there was a ton of uh, noise is what we would call it in the data. So part of being a data scientist is just removing the noise, setting it up so that um, you don't have biases in your data and you can run um, data science uh, processes, whether it be um, a predictive model or a machine learning algorithm or something. Uh, so it's, it's part of the job. You have to clean up your data. Thank you. Uh, I do have one more question. Off late, a lot of folks have been posting about like, um, training YouTube channels where they teach folks about their about various methodologies in data science algorithms. Is there anything that you would recommend like to follow YouTube channel or would you rather say uh, do your homework then refer them? Uh, yes, so I don't have a specific YouTube channel in mind. I think it really depends on where your level of learning is. Uh, some of the YouTube channels that I follow are more in depth. Um, there are YouTube channels that uh, summarize articles and uh, articles in terms of like uh, scientific papers. And so I think those are really helpful to get your feet wet in understanding the research behind data science and how um, data science came to be. But it really depends on what you're interested in. So I would recommend just um, seeing what level that you're at and trying to find a, a channel that's applicable. Um, one of the great things about um, awesome machine learning is it has a ton of information about that. So it has blogs and it has podcasts. You can actually look at that and see which one is of most interest to you. Maybe you um, aren't necessarily interested in the nitty gritty statistics details. So you wouldn't want to follow a blog or a podcast about that. And you're, you're more interested in the high level information. Thank you. Looking back at, at the coursework you've done, including your programming certificate and SQL and Python and R. What do you think is the most important programming language, like the base foundation? And, and another addition to that, is there any one, one coursework that you would like recommend that you have to do this? That's a cool. Yeah, really good question. I would say Python. And I think that there are data scientists that would disagree with me. And actually in my um, job as a data scientist now, I don't use Python. So it might seem like bad advice, but Python is what got me started. And a ton of tutorials are in Python. Uh, you can also use R, um, but I think Python for data science is just better. Um, and so if you're interested in starting, I would learn Python and start doing tutorials in Python. The um, uh, how to automate the boring stuff with Python is what I used to learn. And then there's also the Python data science handbook. So um, learning uh, uh, Python and how to apply it to data science. Thank you. If anyone else has any questions, please post in the chat.
just while we wait for folks to uh, give some post some questions on it on the on the, on the Venn diagram you posted there is business there is computer science there is uh, math statistics in your day-to-day -day work what percent of your work goes in like the business side versus stack side versus mm -hmm. like the actual computer science programming side that is such a good question. I want to say 33% for everything, but I know that's not true. Um, I would say 40% statistics, 30%, um, 40% statistics, 40% domain um, expertise, and 20%, uh, right? 40, 40, 20, 20% computer science. Thank you. And the reason that I say that is um, because coding is important, um, but I definitely don't need to know everything about coding. Uh, so because a lot of these problems have been done by other people before, there are a ton of resources. So if I need to know how to do something, um, I can just use Google and um, research how to code it, uh, whereas the statistical knowledge and the domain knowledge are more, um, you, you need to know it and you need to know what to look for, if that makes sense. Thank you. And in, in when the 40% on the business knowledge you mentioned, how often in that is, how often do you actually of the 40%, like what, how often do you go and actually present your work to the stakeholders involved? And like, how do you work? How do you make the data science piece of it more, uh, more basic? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, you can't necessarily use uh, data science jargon uh, to stakeholders that don't know um, about data science. Uh, it can get, confusing, overwhelming, and then also just not helpful. Um, so you need to be able to take the technical aspect of your job and the things that you're working on and explain it in terms that you've learned from the business area, if that makes sense. So not necessarily um, make it more basic, but present it in a way that will be better understood to your audience. Uh, so I'm not going to necessarily talk about t-test. Uh, oh, I did this t-test and this is the result. Instead, what I would do is I looked at your problem and I found that this is the outcome. Uh, and then if they're interested, you can tell them about the t-test, um, but it's not necessarily something that they need to know. They need to know um, the end result. Thank you. Looking at the chat, anyone have any more questions? Anything you want to ask Jess? I have a hypothesis. I'm I'm into superheroes. Uh, do you think like the extra test, you know, Captain Marvel? Do you think all these superheroes would have some form of data science powers that they could actually quickly mine the data from earth and see where the issue is happening or where there is happening and they jump in there do you think that's a possibility um yeah i think so maybe maybe tony stark had some abilities um he was super smart uh yeah i think it would be a really helpful superpower it might not necessarily um, uh translate to the big screen as exciting, just knowing a lot of information. Maybe Dr. Strange too. I mean, I know he, he does things with the time stone and everything, but uh, um, yeah, I think, I think it would be a superpower. I would consider it a superpower, uh, being able to just take data and finding a solution just instantly. Thank you. We have a question. How can a journalist use data for storytelling and reporting? Yeah, really good question. Um, 
so I, I would suggest um, based off of the information that the journalist is reporting on, uh, you can use data to um, lead the reader to an outcome. Um, so presenting data is uh, something that um, could be a talk in and of itself. Um, so it's not necessarily something that is um, really like intuitive, like you do have to learn it. And so the, the I would just say, find out what story you're trying to tell and then get the data set up in a way that another person can read a chart or um, read a graph and understand that same story. Uh, so storytelling with data is uh, little words. Um, as little words as possible and still be able to to get uh, the idea that the graph is trying to to make. Thank you. Uh, Joel has a question. How can data scientists help our country get away from fake news and misinformation? Yeah, that's a good question. That's actually an area of data science. Um, you can use data science to uh, flag fake information just through natural language processing. Um, there's actually a website that I use. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with it. It's called FakeSpot, uh, fakespot.com, I believe. And you can put um, an Amazon listing or um, other website listings in there and be it essentially runs an algorithm to be able to tell based off of the text of the reviews whether or not the reviews are fake or not. And that's similar to uh, fake news as well, right? So essentially, it's going to um, scour the article. The fake news is a, a little bit different in the sense that it'll sc sc scour, excuse me, the article and be able to scrub the web and be able to tell if this information is real or not. And you can also do it in a smaller scale of just looking at um, reviews from Amazon and being able to tell if the information is real or not. And it essentially looks for certain words um, and the repeated use of certain words or the repeated use of phrases in slightly different ways or even maybe identical uh, that a user wouldn't necessarily be able to um, find easily, but a computer algorithm, data science, it can run through things instantly. Joel commented, it's interesting. I do have um, one more question, not on the, on the fake news, but more on, um, more on excluding some kinds of bias. Does data science help in the data, look in the data and mitigate or remove biases as humans who may have on various things? Uh, chocolate is better yeah. than candies. So is that something mm -hmm. it can eliminate? Yeah, it can eliminate it, but it can also introduce it. Uh, so it's it's something that you have to be conscious of when you're working in data science. Uh, so um, the computer really only does what you tell it to do, right? So if you tell it to run this uh, data science model and give me an answer, um, it'll say, yeah, this is, um, this is looking great. Uh, your statistical tests that you ran are, um, showing that there's a relationship between X and Y and um, that, that's all it'll really do. So you need to be able to interpret that. Uh, so it'll be able to pull out the bias, but it'll also um, not necessarily be able to read the bias if you don't set up your data in a way um, that essentially is clean. Uh, so an example of this, going back to uh, the project that I worked on uh, for the animal shelter outcomes, there were a couple of outcomes that I realized that were just noise uh, when you looked at it. So um, the animal shelter outcome of, um, uh, it was called transfer. Um, I wasn't really sure what that meant, but if I just uh, 
gave the algorithm the information, it would look at transfer and it would be able to tell whether or not an animal was transferred or not. Um, but then when I started to look at it, I realized that, that that wasn't necessarily the case. And I was able to find that out through a, it's called a confusion matrix. Um, and it'll be able to tell you about the specificity. Um, so like uh, true positives and true negatives of your data. Uh, so in that way, if you set it up, it can pull out biases and inform you of biases. Um, but you need to set it up in that way. Or otherwise, if you just take numbers as fact and don't kind of like investigate more, uh, you'll have biases in your data and make conclusions that aren't necessarily accurate. Thank you. That's actually good to know. How, so some of the data science, science work and some of the folks who actually um, have data science projects, they often say like data science can solve the problem. Like, so uh, any project, any question they have, it goes to, let me ask my data scientists. They can figure out an answer. But how would, in their mind, in most of the stakeholders' mind, they think there is 100% accuracy knowing it is a algorithm, it is a machine generated model. How, do, how should we as uh, people in data and people entering into the data science uh, talk about, set expectations with a stakeholder? Like this is again, not gonna be like. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, models are, really never going to be 100% accurate. If it is 100% accurate, it probably means there's something wrong with your data. Uh, maybe you have all pictures of cats. And then so if it accurately classifies an image 100% of the time, well, if it's all cats, then it's easy to do that. You just pick cats. Uh, so I would actually um, caution against uh, too high of a um, accuracy when you're testing your model because it could mean that there's there's something amiss with your data you need to fine tune your model you, you start out uh running your model you get accuracy and then generally you're going to have to fine tune it until you get a model that works with your data so if it's too good from the start it's usually too good to be true and so i would caution against expecting 100 percent accuracy when you're talking to your stakeholders but also understanding that like not only are computers not 100% accurate, but humans aren't 100% accurate either. Um, and there is uh, something interesting that I learned through school, uh, through schooling, especially with image classification um, and the x-ray work that I did is that radiologists didn't always necessarily agree on what the image represented, uh, what pathology or disease the patient had. And so if a radiologist doesn't always necessarily agree uh, with each other, it's very likely that a computer is going to have a hard time with that accuracy as well. You can improve um, the accuracy that a human would otherwise have, but you're still not going to get 100% accuracy. So just kind of educating your um, stakeholder of this is what we're predicting. And you can also include confidence intervals. This is how confident we are that our prediction is going to fall within this um, range. And that's part of statistics and part of the statistics that you need for data science. Thank you. Anyone have any other questions, comments? Yes, I was actually really, uh, I really like the timeline you put in, the journey and each step. That was really nice. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's something that looking back, um, it, it feels like a long time. It took me, what, nine years? Uh, from when I graduated undergrad to when I became a data scientist, but I was um, making important steps in achieving my ultimate goal along the way. And I didn't graduate automatically thinking like I want to be a data scientist, but I kind of uh, worked my way into it based off of understanding my interests and talking to my graduate advisor or other people that I network with and just through learning um, in my career that this is something that interests me. 
Uh, so it's not going to be the same timeline for any everyone. I don't want to scare you, anyone and say you're not going to be a data scientist until nine years from now, because uh, that's definitely not the case. Um, I'm sure that some of the work that you've already done would be a milestone on, in the middle of the timeline like mine was. Thank you. That's a good point. And uh, let's hope the finding the session very informative and appreciating your time and sharing the experience. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate everyone's time and allowing me to share my story and always happy to uh, answer any questions. I know that my LinkedIn was included in the um, uh, uh, meetup, um, but yeah, uh, feel free. Uh, if anyone thinks of any questions uh, after the talk to just shoot them my way, always happy to talk. Thank you, Jess. Anyone have, I know we have close to 10 minutes. Uh, any last questions? And just any, any tips, last tips that came to your mind that you would like to share? And then Becca, I'll turn it over to you if you want to share some stuff. Yeah, um, one thing that I do want to just quickly touch base about and I tried to emphasize this in the Venn diagram of um, what makes what what data science encompasses is that I think especially in technology fields, imposter syndrome is a problem for some people, especially for someone like me who was um, coming from a non-technical background and trying to break into a technical career is that um, a lot of tech is not easy. It's okay to fail. It's okay to um, have questions and spend hours just trying to find a solution to why your code isn't running or uh, why you can't get something to work that, the way that you think it is. And it's just part of learning and understanding that um, it, it's not something that necessarily comes easy and uh, you don't need to be an expert in everything in order to be good at something. Great advice. All right, Jess, this was a fantastic session. I absolutely love, I know everybody here really enjoyed learning from your experience and your journey and all the amazing details you have shared. This is uh, really, really informative. And uh, I appreciate that you also shared your LinkedIn profile on Meetup and I'm sure we'll reach out to you uh, if you have more questions. Thank you. Yep. Thank you all for joining and for all the amazing questions you had asked us. This was a great session. Thank you and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.